So let me start, if I may, with the, the first pillar, the historical context. And here I'd like to highlight the legacy in this region. Now, my starting point is the Arab world as such, which we can define culturally. And here, in fact, the map goes to the Islamic world, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. But in fact, when we think about it, it's far more than that. You have other, there's a geographical understanding, the Middle East and North Africa. You have a religious one I just mentioned, the Islamic world. But you have at least three states in this region that are non-Arab and non some of them are Muslim, Israel, Turkey, and Iran. Some appear on this map. But I would argue to you that this is misleading. That in fact, there's an interconnection of all of this. That whatever happens in Libya has an impact on the Sahel. Whatever happens in Egypt has an impact on the whole of the Nile Valley. Whatever happens in Syria has an impact in obviously Turkey and therefore Europe and so on and so forth. And this side of the Mediterranean beams back into the other side of the Mediterranean. Globalization. Interconnectedness. We cannot think of the Arab world or the, these revolutions are being isolated. Even historically, it did not in fact make sense, but now I think more so than ever. So we're looking at an area that is increasingly defined in terms of interconnectedness. It's an area which also, however, has its own history. And when we, when we go through books and studies and, and policy briefs up until now produced by think tanks, we encounter a number of concepts. I'll throw in there some of them. The circumstances in which the region is born, the peripherality of it, the Middle East, the Near East, the Far East, far to what, middle to what, near to what, important concepts to keep in mind. Westernization, sometimes desired, sometimes rejected, sometimes violent, sometimes friendly. There's a relationship to the West which is fundamental. I'll come back to it in a minute with some maps. Fragmentation. The state building process has been incomplete, and therefore it's very difficult to think now of unity when you bring into the table a history of fragmentation. I think this is an objective reality of that. The vulnerability of the region. It's a region that has not encountered modernity so easily. Colonization, colonialism has been there fundamentally. The memory of a golden age. This is a region that has been three times imperial. The Sassanid Persian Empire, the Islamic Empire of the Golden Age, and the Ottoman Empire. So a sense of a particular grand history is very much built in in the recent memory as such. The Ottoman Empire falls technically in 1924. When the last emperor, in fact, moves here to Lausanne, or Montreux, I think, even. Uh, so you have a sense of near history which is very present as such. Rivalry, of course, and constantly aspirations to more democracy, obviously, is what we mean. But generally a sense of uncertainty about where the region is heading until now. So to give us a sense of how recent this is, if you look just, in fact, before World War I, as I was saying, look at the immediate presence of the West from the French, Spanish, and Italian presence in North Africa, to the British one in the Nile Valley, to the remnants of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, therefore, and, of course, the British all over. The only place in the region that has never been colonized, and it's an important marker of its independence, quote unquote, is what will become Saudi Arabia, the Arabia at the time. It's very important, and in fact, I will argue to you that the sense of um, confidence that Saudi Arabia today has comes from these two elements. Oil, which we know of, but also the absence of a colonial experience as such. These two elements are central to that. Secondly, if we jump about 50 years later, in the 60s, you find that you still have a situation. <coughs> You're not too far from the previous map. You still have an immediate presence. Now, why do I show you this? Because I think when we have the French presidents, Sarkozy, the previous one, landing into Tripoli and announcing the liberation of Libya after its own spring, it brings colonial memories to a lot of people in that region. It has, an, and with, by the way, on his side, the British Prime Minister. So you have a sense of the relationship to the West which is extremely complex, particularly today, and there's something there that I'd like to discuss with you, let alone, of course, the involvement of the United States that comes after, uh, after uh, the UK in 56 and so on. So 
This is the historical background. We have an incomplete state building process, which is never dealt with from the beginning, 1910s or 1960s. The state does not completely acquire independence as such. Immediately after that, rather than being born in a democratic setting, unfortunately, most of the new regimes display authoritarian tendencies. And this is the mainstay of what led to um, 40 years, 50 years later, the spring, 60 years in some cases. The post-colonial Arab authoritarian state. There's no understating that, overstating that as much as one can. This is essentially the story. One key element that I'd like to mention to you, which is often forgotten, is attempts, highlight attempts in the 90s to open the system. I recall vividly being part in sessions like these in Cairo in 1993 on the role of civil society, uh, democratic transformation, um, with think tanks, independent think tanks in Egypt, working essentially with the same buzzwords that are currently now on Twitter and so on, of course without the technology at the time. These attempts are very much present and we tend to forget them. Of course we forget them because they failed. By the late 90s, everything was recaptured by the states for simple reasons. The states were younger, stronger, and the Mubarak of the early 90s is not the Mubarak of this year becoming a pharaoh and something far more decrepit as, a, as, a, as an authoritarian ruler. Fourthly, of course, the post 9 11 period. I mentioned it earlier. I think it's a component of the history. You know, I've never, I don't recall seeing a march against terrorism in the Arab world over the past 10 years. You saw march against the situation in Iraq or Palestine or in demand of particular rights. Of course, terrorism was a concern, but you did not see that. That whole story, in fact, was recaptured by the authoritarian state to push for even more authoritarianism in these states. And I think, paradoxically, it laid the, gr it laid the, gr the ground for what ended up happening in 2010 and 2011. Far more alienation of the people in the name, of course, of fighting terrorism. Ben Ali's Tunisia is a perfect example. Mubarak's Egypt as well. So the partnership around what was legitimately looked upon as a security threat, I think, was very smartly turned around by these regimes. But all the time, of course, more frustration, and we move in relation to this, in relation to a state. Now, I'd like to highlight the state. We speak a lot these days about social movements, e revolutionaries, but the state, this primus inter pares, is not going anywhere. It's what is the component of international relations. I think the challenge is for it to be democratized, to be representative, to be open, and to be, of course, based on new constitutional basis, but to imagine that we can reinvent in the early 20th century the new rules of engagement with the same, I think would be a major uh, misreading, or at least a bit idealistic. Maybe you have other views, but let's see how that is. What we have seen, however, is some key markers of the state of the region. First of all, all of these states date back to the 20th century. They're extremely young. They themselves in the process of finding out their own identity and legitimacy. And that legitimacy is, what do I mean by the persistence of extra-governmental sites of legitimacy? Anyone, any idea comes to anyone's mind? Those places that are constantly vying for alternative definition of legitimacy, what the tribe, the family, the religion, of course, the community, all of these places that are far more present and to which people think often more of themselves, say, as a Misrati, a Ben Ghazi, a someone from Tripoli, uh, Zantan, we're thinking about Libya, than as the new Libya. This is what's happening today with the proliferation of militias. And it's a challenge to the identity being defined. How do you go for that to reach a representative, democratized, and, and legitimate, of course, state is the issue. Of course, all the time, the state in the region has been laid, imposed, and forced upon a very heterogeneous kind of population and structure as such. Joel Migdal has uh, written an excellent book in the late 80s called Strong societies, weak states, which I recommend you take a look at. Because in fact, in the Middle East and North Africa, the societies are far stronger in terms of their tradition than the, than the states that are being built. And it's this kind of relationship that is interesting to me. So the place of the state is one marker that I invite you to look at. Authoritarianism is displayed in the following four manners. One, 
the social base, not the society itself, as I said, is not weak, but the base of connections, because it has been weakened precisely by the state in playing out different um, tribes against, against each other. Gaddafi, again, did that very well. Or different uh, factions. Uh, think about Syria, think about the, the war of the Alawites there. Um, conflict between and, and within social movements. There's a lot of conflictuality at the root of the system. And if you get to a point where everybody joins together for the revolutionary moment, it's important. But what happens after, this is what I'm turning to, is the key moment. Ultimately, and I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but I might as well share this with you, revolutions are a moment. Transitions are a phase. It's two different things, two different animals. A moment, which is about energy, energy release. Transitions are about skills. It's about skills. Skill acquisition, in fact, right? writing new constitutions, devising alliances, uh, building a new structure that is lasting in the long term. It's not longer about revolutions which can last days, weeks, months. Transitions last decades, years. It's a very, very long process. And this is where these aspects are brought into the equation. Finally, the presence of the military. This does not come as a surprise to you, but because the authoritarian state in the region relied so heavily on the military, you have now societies that have been excessively militarized. One key element which I'd like to discuss with you as well is the drift, or let's say the evolution, let's not qualify, the evolution in the Syrian opposition to Assad from a political opposition to today a militarized opposition. Was this inevitable? Is this necessary? Could this be the way to actually unseat him? And what will this mean in the future? These are the questions that we have to say. Is it unavoidable fundamentally as such? Yes. 